Um, welcome everyone to our sixth uh, talk on Corona Verde. My name is Anna Nevidomska and I'm the outreach coordinator for the virus pathogen resource and the influenza resource database. Um, today uh, joining me is my colleague Christian, who is going to be discussing uh, Corona Verde ortholog group prediction. And um, he's going to give you a quick introduction to um, the background of what orthologs are um, and the various different types of data we have on them for the coronaviruses and what we plan to implement in the future because um, this is still a work in progress. But we're hoping to have the data <clears throat> up on the website uh, in, the, in the coming months. This, just as a quick disclaimer, this will be recorded. So if you miss anything, you can uh, find it on YouTube as well um, shortly after. So uh, welcome again. And Christian, if you'd like to get started, please go ahead. OK, thank you. Yeah, my name is uh, Christian Smozek, and I'm a, I'm a senior bioinformatics engineer at the JCVI. And before, I was working on, uh, well, evolutionary biology a lot. So I have some experience in that field. So, and. What I'm actually going to talk is is also kind of related to work I did previously before I joined JCVI. And uh, another thing is I have to say that tomorrow or the day after tomorrow I will I will also you will get a, a handout of of this presentation. So with maybe a little bit more detailed information in it and links to maybe websites and things like that. So you don't have to take any notes or anything like that. So it will be emailed to you at some point. As I said, maybe tomorrow or the day after tomorrow. And yeah, so basically our today's presentation is a little bit different uh, than the, the 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 workshops you had before for two reasons. First, it's a little bit more theory because I assume that uh, people may be not that familiar with this topic, and also it will be a little bit different because the actual data is not really in Viper yet in in a useful form. So those are the kind of two differences from. If you have attended the previous workshops, so anyway, so let's start with the the motivation. So basically, the the motivation for this work is to allow the the comparison of of proteins across across different uh, coronavirus genera. You know, for example, co compare beta coronaviruses with alpha coronaviruses. They're the proteins you find there. Or even among subgenera like sarvicovirus or marvicovirus, because currently it's difficult and confusing, especially for the accessory proteins, to compare them because they are named according to their position in the genome, and not based on homology and function. So that means that, for example, for let's use, let's use the or seven. So in HIV virus or seven is not related to norvicovirus or seven. They might be in the same position, but they are not related in function, or uh, there's no sequence similarity between the, uh, between these two or sevens. And so this naming is very confusing because it, you know it sounds like it's the same thing, but it's not. And so what we want to do is kind of like you know create a a, a nomenclature which you can apply across all the different. Um, di different genera, and which is telling you where you find a certain protein. And what it's doing, and if it has the same name, it is the same thing, you know, in all different uh, different species. So, uh, a little bit more formally. So, the goal is to what we want to do is we want to actually classify proteins into groups, which have the same domain architecture, and which are orthologous to each other. And I have to say, I'm using a, a lot of terms now, which I said some people might not understand. But I will go over the background and then I restate the goal again. So then it, it will make more sense. But this is, you know, for now, I will explain everything. And we term this, these groups of, of proteins, we, we term them strict orthologous groups because they're not, all, as I said, they're not only orthologous, but they also have the exact same domain architecture. And in addition, we also, uh, we will have a, for these groups, there will be, the, their name will have a suffix which indicates where you can find this protein. And we kind of use the, uh, this kind of scheme where we, if something is uppercase, it means it's found in every beta coronavirus analyzed. And if it's lowercase, it means it's found in some beta coronaviruses, but not in all of them. And for example, an, ex an example would be 
membrane protein M, coronavirus A, which means that membrane protein is, is found in all the coronavirus A virus. The example from before, like we have ORF7 Hibico virus and ORF7 Nobico virus, which then are, are different from each other because they have a different name. So, so that's kind of the goal of what we want to do, you know, have a classification of, of proteins across all the different uh, species of coronaviruses. And, that, and as I already mentioned, it, that's a little bit unfortunate or because at this point, this data is actually not in Viper yet. So for herpes severity, day, we have this SOG data and it's manually curated and it's there and you can use it and I'll actually show it to you. But for the coronavirus, day, there is SOG data in Viper too, but it's, it's preliminary and it was only um, calculated automatically and it's not very, it's not necessarily wrong or, or inaccurate, but it's not very useful because it was not manually curated. But uh, at some point, probably in the winter of 2021, I will upload much better SOG data for, for coronavirus day. And uh, our work in uh, herpes virus day has, has actually been published and it described in detail what we did. So if you're interested, you can read this paper and uh, pretty much the same thing would apply for the, for the coronavirus family too. So, okay, now uh, next couple of slides will be about the, the background to make you, you know, to help you understand the goals a little bit better. So I will talk about protein domains, PFAM, homology, evolution by gene duplication, orphology and parology, orphology versus function, and how we find orphological sequences. So, so first thing, I mentioned the term protein domains before, and I assume really not molecular biologists, maybe not know. So, so basically what a, a protein domain is, it's a region of a protein which can function, evolve, and exist independently from the rest of the, of the protein. So, and it's actually the different combinations of, of proteins which, uh, which give a protein its, you know, its function. So, so there really are units which exist as that they exist independently from each other. And uh, PFAM is a, is a large database of, of protein domains uh, uh, represented by hidden Markov models. And uh, we actually will use PFAM domain definitions for our work, but there are other databases which could be used, but the uh, PFAM is, is widely used and it's widely accepted. So, so that's the one we're using. So we usually when I say domain, I actually mean a PFAM domain as defined by PFAM. Uh, I mentioned, I mentioned that uh, uh, the domains can be arranged in different architecture. And he, here I give you, uh, it's an example from coronaviruses, the, the well-known spike proteins. And if we're looking at the spike proteins from different uh, families of coronaviruses, we can see that actually, even though they're all spike proteins and they have some domains in common, namely the this domain here, um, the S2 domain. Then there's other domains in, in which they're different, namely the, and, and those are the PFAM domain names, are the beta coronavirus S1 domain, the receptor binding domain specifically. So they differ on the, on the N terminals. They have very different domains, as you can see. And that's when I say domain architecture, that's what I mean. So you have a whole protein, and then the protein has different domains. But in between different species, the, the arrangement and even presence and absence of domains is different. So, so if we compare, for example, this alpha coronavirus spike protein with this beta coronavirus protein, we can see it's very, it, I mean, it's very different in, in the domain it has. And so those, those are examples of domain architectures. But I have to say that's kind of the spike protein in a way is a little bit an exception that it has multiple domains. Most proteins in a, in coronaviruses only have one domain. So they're the, the, what I call the domain architecture is just one domain, but spike protein is more interesting. It has, has multiple domains. So that's an example about uh, domain architectures. And I, I think I already used the term homologs. And again, it's very, it's a very commonly used, but just to remind people about the definition, it's actually, it was uh, invented in 1966 by Fitch 
And what it means is sequences with a with a common ancestor. So now again, if you're looking at this example here, we have a little phylogenetic G of a of coronavirus, the membrane protein M, and uh, we have three species here: human coronavirus NL63, SARS coronavirus 2, and human coronavirus OC43. And as people working with coronavirus know, OC43 and source they're both members of beta coronaviruses and the uh, nl63 is an alpha coronavirus so, but what it means by homologs is basically that all these membrane proteins they have a common ancestor so this will be the ancestor of all coronaviruses and it already had a, a membrane protein and then it, it gave rise to these different current day membrane proteins and we can say that this protein here and me membrane protein M from oc63 it's a homologue for the SARS protein, and it's also homologue to NL63. So because they're related by evolution and they have a common ancestor, and they can be aligned, and they, they're similar in, in function. And uh, so those are homologues. And then homologues can be actually divided into different types of homologues. We have, uh, we have orthologs, which are div uh, diverged by speciation event, and the paralogs, which are uh, diverged by duplication event. And then we have synologs, which are related by horizontal gene transfer, but these are not the focus. So if we go back to this slide here, since we uh, since this tree here actually uh, corresponds to the evolutionary tree for coronaviruses, so every node here is actually would be a speciation. And uh, that means those those proteins here, they're not only they're not only homologs, they're actually orthologs too, because again. If we look at the, the node, for example, connecting this protein with this protein, here, this is speciation, so they're so they're orthologs. Paralogs are actually in, in viruses are very uh, not very common. So most because uh, I guess viruses try to keep their genome small, so there's simply not that much duplication. So we rarely actually see a, a paralog. And that's why I, I use this kind of example here, just for you know for general understanding, because most people are maybe familiar with with, um, <clears throat> with animals, and uh, this is just a, a made up tree, but just to give you the concept of orthologs and parallax. So for example, if we and I mark what I have to say is I mark the the internal nodes, which correspond to a, a duplication. I, uh, I mark them with a with a dot. So those those two. Uh, nodes are duplications. Uh, how I determine that those are duplications, I'll explain later, but for now, it's, let's assume we just know those are duplications. So now if we, for example, compare this mouse A sequence with human A sequence, so the node connecting them here is a, is a speciation, so those two orthologs. Now if we compare mouse A sequence with rat B, that will, for example, now the node here is a is a duplication, so those will be paralogs. So, so the A sequences are paralogs, the B sequences. And now, if we again, if we compare mouse A with, like, for, let's say yeast X one, again here the node is a is a is a speciation, so that means they're they're orthologs. Whereas, for example, the relationship between X one and X two, since they're connected by duplication, they're paralogs. So, and you can see some of those parallels appear in the, in the same species. But for example, if we now if we compare human A with rat B, they are different species, but they're still, they're still parallels because the node here is a, is a duplication. Okay. Uh, why I talked about orthologs, but why are actually, why are you interested in that? The reason why we're interested in it is because orthologs oftentimes they tend to have a, a more similar function than parallax. But this is not always true, and it's it's called the orthologic uh, conjecture, and it's not, it's actually still a topic of active research. And we have to keep in mind that orthologs are mathematically defined, and whereas for sequence function, there's no strict definition, so different people have different definitions for function. And the, uh, if you're interested in, as I said, this the relationship between function and uh, uh, morphology is actually a, it's a topic of 
of research and there's many papers published you know co continuously so so to be clear if something is an orthologue it might have the same function but it's not guaranteed and also the opposite is not necessarily true you cannot say if something has a similar function that they're orthologs because there are as i said those are uh they're kind of different thing uh, different things so morphology is defined on a on a phylogenetic chain tree and function is maybe you know defined by 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 chemistry and doesn't necessarily mean if something is an orthologue they have to have to have the same function but may, many people assume so and they they make a mistake and they say oh those two sequences are they have the same function so they must be orthologs but that's it's not true so it can be true but it's not always true Okay, uh, as I said, just to uh, give you an example how we actually determine where is it, if we have a gene duplication or not. So if you're looking at this tree here, where we have three, three different species from coronaviruses, it's very easy to say that this must be a duplication because, for example, SARS coronavirus 2 appears here and here, and the only way to explain this one is that this node must be a duplication, the gene has duplicated. But in this tree here, we, we only see uh, we only see each species once. So why is this a duplication? We can only say that if we compare it with a with a species tree, the, the tree of life, because we realize that the again the two uh, beta coronaviruses should be closer together than the alpha coronaviruses. But it's not true not true here. Here we have you know one beta coronavirus is outside, and we have alpha and beta together here. And the only, th only way to reconcile this, this gene tree here is if we say that um, this is actually an incomplete tree, maybe because of gene loss or maybe because uh, our database is incomplete, but actually the tree, you know, it actually looks like this. And so the only way to explain this again is here's a duplication. And we simply don't see this, you know, these other sequences here and the third sequence here is gone. So if we have a, a gene tree, and it doesn't, uh, you know, correspond to the to a species tree here. The way to resolve this is by introducing gene duplications, and there are computational algorithms to do that. And uh, now I will quickly mention how we actually infer orthology. It's, there's two main approaches. One is based on re reciprocal best similarity, and the other one is actually based on calculating phylogenetic tree likes here. Uh, Methods from based on uh, similarity, you probably have heard of the well-known COGS, the cluster of orthologous groups, or in paranoid or or for MCL, which is used in uh, in Viper. So those are our methods which are based on on be uh, you know best pairwise similarity. And uh, I, I won't go into it much detail, but uh, the, here again you get a handout later. It explains how, for example, how the the COGS work. Cluster for follows groups. It's it's basically it's based on blastates, which sequences are, you know, top hits, and then they have to be, you know, reciprocal. So you can build these networks. One problem is that if you do that, the uh, the clusters of orthologs get too big. The you know the map the the more simpler methods they they put too much too many sequences into one group and the, which are incorrect, and. Uh, this more advanced method or for MCL, it tries to solve this problem by by using a, a Markov cluster algorithm to split up huge clusters by simulating how actually a liquid flows through a, a graph. But again, I won't go into this into this much detail. But if you're if you're working on Viper, you you come across or for MCL because it's used there, and uh, so you have to realize this is a it's a method to determine orthologs based on uh, sequence similarity. And uh, comparing tree building, I mean, uh, orthology inferring on, on trees and on similarity, what are the advantages and the disadvantages? For well, the clustering method, the advantages, they're very fast and they're not affected by false duplication uh, uh, caused by inaccurate gene trees. The, and the disadvantage of orthology clustering methods, the, the chronology of events is lost. The tree topologies are gone because it's all it's flat. Everything is based on on similarity. So, okay. Now that I I mentioned this 
uh, this I went over the terms like like protein domains and the morphology and the gene trees. I can restate the goal again. Maybe it's uh, it's, no, it's mo a little bit more clear now. So our goal here in this work with the SOG morphology morphologous sequences is to is to classify proteins into groups which share the exact same domain architecture. Remember the, the spike protein example, and also which are related by speciations to each other, which means that they're orthologs. And we call this one strict orthologue groups. And in addition to this, we also, uh, we want to name, we want to provide a name for each SOG, which is made out of two parts. One part of the name is, it's its function, if we know the function of the protein, and there's a suffix which indicates where the protein is, is found. Again, uh, the example here, for example, the membrane, pro the membrane protein M, that's, that would be the function. It's a membrane protein M, and it's found in all coronaviridae. So that's, it, it is SOG will get this name. Uh, on the other hand, something which is uh, uh, specific to a subgenus, sub sub like ORF7, here we don't really know the function, but it's, it's, it's on position eight, so we call this one ORF7 Hebecol virus. Another ORF7 from Novicol virus, which are unrelated to uh, the Hebecol uh, ORF7, but which are on the same, it's the same position, it would be called ORF7 Novicol virus to make, you know, to make clear that they're, they're different from each other. So there's no more ambiguity in, in naming. So, sorry. And, uh, yeah, I already mentioned that, and uh, so I don't need to go this slide. And again, the goal is we want to give each one, just to remind you, the naming works like this. If we have something which the, the, the suffix is all uppercase, it means it's found in every beta coronavirus. Whereas if it's lowercase, it's found in some beta coronaviruses, but not in all. And uh, now I, I can give you some uh, uh, example from my from my current work, which will be uploaded into, into a Viper this winter, but it's not there yet. So the, the core proteins are the one, the proteins which are found in all the, the, you know, the, the genomes analyzed of a given group. So for coronavirus, the core, there's a very few core proteins. Uh, for now, let's, let's not really look at the, the, the polyprotein because that's, I will show you, that's more complicated example. And the spike protein, we already discussed, so they're, they're present in all the, uh, the coronaviruses, but they have a different domain architecture. But then the ones which are, have the same domain architecture across all the coronaviruses are actually very few. That's the membrane protein M, which would get this name, membrane protein M, coronaviridae. The envelope small membrane protein has this P feminate, and this will be the SOG name for it, envelope small membrane coronaviridae. The nuclear protein, it has a, uh, the, the, the PFEM domain is called, that's the name of the PFEM domain. And um, this would be the name for the, the SOG. So the function and its distribution. And then we have another one, the, the non-structural protein 3B, which is represented by, by this uh, PFEM. This one is different because it's, it's, it's not, it's actually, it's only found in alpha and beta, but in all of them. So this will get, get a, a name like this, NS, NS3B, alpha, beta, so that indicates it's found in all alpha coronaviruses and in all beta coronaviruses. So that's the, pretty much, I mean, this example, this in a way shows you everything we wanted to do. So group proteins into SOGs, which have, which have a, na a name which indicates its function and uh, the distribution. And the name has to be unique. So if you, something has the same name, I mean, including the suffix, that means it's, those proteins are related to each other. And if the name is different, that means they're unrelated. So there's no more ambigu ambiguity. If, you know, again, this, this example of ORF7, which, you know, ORF7 by itself is you, you would think, oh, or seven here and or seven in Novicorus, it's the same thing, but they are not at all related to each other. You can't align them. So they're totally different from each other. And again, here is the example, as I said, 
from this table, I said this, the spike protein is more complicated. So here we're looking at it now. So the spike protein is, is present in all, uh, of course, in all coronaviruses, but it actually, its domain architecture is different. And so, so then the name of this will be, for example, this, this architecture or this SOG would, would be called like spike, uh, spike protein delta coronaviruses. Whereas this architecture would be called spike protein gamma coronavirus because they're specific to, uh, you know, these groups. And even more, I won't really go into it in this presentation because it's still, I'm still kind of working on it, but uh, even more complicated are the, the polyproteins, which are, uh, they're different, actually, they're quite different from each other. And uh, so, especially in beta coronavirus, we have, uh, there's a great variability on the, on the domains on it, especially on the end terminus, towards the end terminus. So those are the, but here you can see the different uh, polyproteins. And at the end, they, they will each get a name, you know, and uh, a, a suffix, which indicates it's, it's their distribution. So now I talked about the, the things or the, the proteins, which are uh, is similar across all the, the coronaviruses, namely the polyproteins, the spike protein, and, and these proteins. But then we have we also have the the accessory proteins, and uh, it, here's an example of the accessory proteins from a couple of beta coronaviruses, and those are very different between even if you, for example, if you com, uh, compare sorbicovirus with novicovirus. They have, even though the names might be, as I said, the traditional names used, they might be similar, but actually, if you look at it on a, on a molecular level there, or, yeah, if you, if you try to align them, they're, they're different. So they would all get different, uh, SOG names. So like, for example, Mervicovirus or five or Mervicovirus or AB or Novicovirus or three. So Novicovirus or three. So, so that's how the, the accessory proteins will be classified. So they're specific for each subgenus. So whereas the other, like the membrane proteins, they're pretty much uniform across all the, the coronaviruses. Okay, so so that's kind of the, the theory. And as I said, now I show you uh, what's what's present in, uh, in, in Viper. And uh, I'll switch the, the, the presentation now, and uh, again, the data is is pretty complete for uh, um, herpes viruses. It's mainly curated; it has been published, and the data for coronaviruses, which is currently in Viper, is not it's not necessarily wrong, but it's it's not very useful because it's it's not it was not mainly curated yet, but it will be. And these names you you can see here, this data will will be appearing in maybe in the winter. It will appear in in, in Viper. So this is the is, is, is the Viper website, and uh, I already opened the the section for. As I said, we, we can first look at the the herpes viruses. So I, I opened the the section for the herpes viruses, and uh, so that's the, the page. And you probably already, if you attended the previous uh, workshops, you probably already familiar with the different function here. The search, you know, searching and the here you have your anal analysis methods like phylogeny and tree inference and so on. So I'm not talking about that. I'm, I'm just showing you very quickly the, the orphology uh, section, so to speak. So you can, can access it here. You can, you can see it says orpho orpho orpholog groups. You can also go in if you go search data, um, you can also find it. You can also find it there. I mean, what I want to show is here. If you, know, if you go here and then you see it, or follow groups. So it's either here on the page as a, as a menu item, or if you mouse over search data, where you have search sequence, you know, post factor experiments, protein motifs, so on. And here's the or follow groups. So but let's click on it. And uh, then you can see, if you come here, uh, you see the diff that you can see here uh, the different types of uh, uh, or follow groups we have here. 
And these are the SOGs, the one I talked uh, I talked about, but you can also see the ORFO MCL groups, which I also talked about a little bit. So the, the ORFO, ORFO MCL group are calculated by the ORFO MCL algorithm and they're based on pairwise uh, best similarity. Whereas the SOGs are calculated by my own pipeline and there's part, I mean, they're in a way they're manually curated. So there's this one, was, I mean, they're calculated semi-automatically. And if you just go, for example, you can just look at all of them because there's not too many. So you just, you will click to select uh, SOG groups. And also if you want to read about it, there's this SOP, you can go there and you can again, read the definition and you go like search. So now they're here and uh, now it's the, the things I talked about. So, so here's the name for the orphalic groups. And again, it's, it's a combination of a, of the function of the protein and a, a suffix which indicates the, the distribution of the proteins. For example, if you look at this one here, the major capsid protein. So this one is, is actually found in all herpes really because it has a, it has an uppercase, uh, the, you know, the, the, the suffix is uppercase herpes. Really. So it's found in, so that's a core protein. It's found everywhere in all the, the, the herpes viruses. Whereas, for example, this one here is only found in gamma herpes viruses. Or looking at this protein here, take a main protein TP71, that means it's the lowercase suffix. Uh, it's, uh, it's based in some beta colon viruses, but not in all of them. Or here, the envelope glycoprotein M, again, is, is a core protein. It's found in all herpes every day. And then here you can see the, the domain architecture. And as I mentioned, most of the, the viral proteins, they're only, they're only composed of, of one domain. So, so that's the domain. Those are the PFM domains. And here we have an example of, a, of one which has, is composed of two domains, the, you know, these two domains. And I always use this kind of a double dash to indicate the, you know, two domains connected. So those two domains, alpha TIF domain and hsvvp 16 c domain. Or, so you can, and you can see the domain combination for all of them. This one here. So that's kind of uh, what I explained. You can see it now here. And uh, you can actually then, you know, let's say, for example, this protein here, if you're in actually interested in here, you can actually go here. And, uh, you know, then you can see the actual proteins. You could click here, and then it will actually show you the protein in detail. So, and then you can see again on, on the, on the, that the protein pages in, you know, for every, every protein has a, uh, you have a, uh, you have a page with a very detailed description. And again, here, actually, you can also find the, the, the SOG, you know, the ORF MCL and the SOG, you see the, here that the, the name is the same. They're both a glycoprotein M, but uh, the SOG provides the additional information that it's it's a core protein found in all herpes really. And if you, if you click here again, you will go back to the list. You know, the, if you, find, you can find the others. So it's not, it's not very, it's not that much you can do at this point. I mean, they're there and you can look at it, but um, it's not like other very complicated methods like uh, SNP calculations, something like that. So there's no algorithm. It's just an annotation which is there and you can, you can search for it and you can look at it. And, uh, now I can also show you uh, we can also do the same thing for the for the coronaviruses and I already opened the page here so we don't have to wait for it. So again you you know you can go here so we go on the coronavirus page and then you go search data and then you go or follow groups and this this page here will open. And uh, as as I said this is currently is not it's not very useful, especially because I was not uh, dealing with the, you see here you have this very long uh, domain architectures and those are the, those are the polyproteins. And those are not at this point, they're not really, um, because there's so many different fragments or uh, you know, part of the polyproteins in the database. So this gets very confusing. So, but once, uh, I manually clean up this data, it will look a little bit different. 
but still um it's the principle is still the same i mean for example here we have the the nuclear protein and uh so that this means it's it's found in it's it distributed across all coronary day but there are some of them which might, might not have it and uh uh you can see here we have this kind of strange number one in there so that's uh that's kind of an artifact from the artificial uh or autom not from the artificial from the automated algorithm to calculate it and in the future this will be it will look cleaner but the principle is still the same you have the orphalog group name with the function and then you have the distribution and uh here's the domain architecture and again so here for example we have a a fragment of a spike protein, S1, S2, they're combined together. And again, it's, 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 it's distributed they call, uh, across all chrono RNA, but not necessarily present in all of them. And then if you go here, again, you would, uh, you know, you would see the individual proteins. But this will be cleaned up and it will be, I think it will be very useful, especially for comparison of the, of the accessory proteins. So, so I hope, uh, I think that's that's it for for the presentation. And uh, there's no real homework or there's no exercises to do. But uh, I encourage you to uh, to go to to Viper and and to look at it. And uh, if you have any if you have any any questions, uh, please ask you know ask me now or, or uh, ask me later at some point. I'm, I'm happy to uh, to ask questions and also. Since this is still a, it's still research in progress. If you have any suggestions for improvement, of course, I'm, I'm happy to to hear that. So, and uh, so, let me. I mean, if you have any questions now, please ask or ask later. So, Christian, there were a couple of questions in the chat. I could read them uh -huh. out loud to you, or um, uh, Dinesh, if you'd prefer to ask them out loud yourself, you can. Um, <clears throat> one of the questions was, is it possible to categorize uh, orthologous groups based on a single protein domain alone instead of the total number of domain sequences in the protein? Uh, you mean like searching for one particular domain and then it shows you all the proteins which have this domain? Um, I'm not sure. <laughs> well, at, uh, at, this, at this point, at this point, no. I mean, the answer is no. It's, I mean, in a, in a way, we we want to take into account all the domains, not 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 just, uh, you know, not just one. But uh, it is indeed might be, uh, maybe in the future we we might expand the ability to search for the SOGs, and then we could actually add the ability to search for just. Say list all SOGs which have, you know, have a certain domain, and maybe have additional ones, but you know, list all of them which have a, have a, have a given domain. Let's say, for example, here, list everything with a ma macro domain, mm -hmm. no matter what the additional domains are. But but at this point, no, you can you cannot do that. It's they're they're fixed. I mean, in a way, that's kind of our goal is to take into account the whole architecture, not just individual domains. Okay, um, and there was another question um, that said, while predicting orthologous groups, what would be the minimum percentage of identity and query cover that's preferred? Uh, uh, that's, that's a good question. So when I when I developed the pipeline to to calculate them, what I used is a uh, to to to. Um, to say something is is present a certain again let's use as an example let's use the ns let's use this nsp8 domain if the pfm match it has to match at least 40 percent of the pfm so if if uh if it only the if the query sequence only matches uh you know it only matches less than forty percent of the of the of the target. Then I I will say it's not present because then I assume if it's truncated that much, it might be it could not be functional anymore. So I will not say it's actually present. And you know, again, for example, this HSP eight. So if it's too short, 
and I was kind of experimenting with it, and it's described in the in the paper for the herpes viruses. If if it's less than forty percent uh, of the length, then I say, you know, it's I say it's not present, even though it's a small fragment is actually present. But then, since I'm interested in function, it's hard to imagine if if something is truncated that much, it still be functional. And for the for the cutoffs, the E value cutoffs, when I, again for the HMM search, I use ten to the minus six as a Oral cutoff, so if, you know it has to match to at least ten to the minus an e value of ten to the minus six. So those are the two conditions: ten to the minus six e value, and the length has to be at least forty percent of the expected length. So that's uh, and that's I mean in a way, um, since it, since the results are pre-calculated, so you cannot. You cannot experiment. You cannot, you know, you cannot change it yourself. So, yeah, in an ideal world, you, you have some kind of a, you know, you could write, recalculate everything on the fly with, with your own thresholds if you want to do so. But it's not, it's not possible at the moment. It's, everything is pre-calculated with thresholds. I, I kind of experiment with it, and I think they were reasonable. But uh, if you want to use your own, you can't. So that any any more questions? I, I can actually see this. Um, it says, is it possible to work with our custom genome upon completion of your work? With a custom genome? Yeah, can they upload their own genomes and uh, uh, have it have it annotated? It's not I mean that's not at this point, no, you, you, you can't. I mean it's it's only uh, it's because it's it's pre-calculated from time to time by me, and it's only you know it only uses the sequences which are in, in Viper, so you cannot uh, have your your own genome. But if somebody is interested, I mean, I could I could do it. I mean, I could do it. By my, I mean, if somebody contacted me, I could do it for them. It's not it's not a it's not a it's not a big deal. But uh, mm -hmm. it's not like Viper can do it. You cannot just upload it and have it annotated already. But you could just take your sequence and blast it against the Viper database, identify the most similar sequence, and then, you know, assume that it would have the same domain architecture. So I just want to also add, well, um, you know, if anyone else has any other questions in the meantime, that, um, you know, all of this data will be uploaded soon. Um, and if you want to know when that will be, you can follow us either on social media. We have, um, Facebook accounts and Twitter pages. And if you also subscribe to our newsletter, we, um, we will also update that um, with the most recent additions to the Viper website early next year. Thank you for attending and uh, we hope to see you again soon.